this is the first of four programs in which I want to question some of the assumptions usually made about the tradition of European painting. That tradition which was born about 1400, died about 1900. Tonight, it isn't so much the paintings themselves which I want to consider, as the way we now see them, now in the second half of the 20th century. Because we see these paintings as nobody saw them before. If we discover why this is so, we shall also discover something about ourselves and the situation in which we are living. The process of seeing paintings or seeing anything else is less spontaneous and natural than we tend to believe. A large part of seeing depends upon habit and convention. All the paintings of the tradition used the convention of perspective, which is unique to European art. Now, perspective centers everything on the eye of the beholder. It is like a, a beam from a lighthouse, only instead of light traveling outwards, appearances travel in. And our tradition of art called those appearances reality. Perspective makes the eye the center of the visible world. But the human eye can only be in one place at a time. It takes its visible world with it as it walks. With the invention of the camera, everything changed. We could see things which were not there in front of us. Appearances could travel across the world. It was no longer so easy to think of appearances always traveling regularly to a single center. I am an eye, a mechanical eye. I, the machine, show your world the way only I can see it. I free myself for today and forever from human immobility. I'm in constant movement. I approach and pull away from objects. I creep under them. I move alongside a running horse's mouth. I fall and rise with the falling and rising bodies. This is I, the machine, maneuvering in the chaotic movements, recording one movement after another in the most complex combinations. Freed from the boundaries of time and space, I coordinate any and all points of the universe wherever I want them to be. My way leads towards the creation of a fresh perception of the world. Thus I explain, in a new way, the world unknown to you. Those words are from a manifesto written in 1923 by Ziga Vertov, the Russian film director. And the images are from a film he made in 1928 called The Man with a Movie Camera. The invention of the camera has changed not only what we see, but how we see it. And in a crucial but quite simple way, it has even changed paintings painted long before it was invented. The painting on the wall, like a human eye, can only be in one place at one time. The camera reproduces it, making it available in any size, anywhere, for any purpose. Botticelli's Venus and Mars used to be a unique image which it was only possible to see in the room where it was actually hanging. Now its image, or a detail of it, or the image of any other painting which is reproduced, can be seen in a million different places at the same time. As you look at them now, on your screen, your wallpaper is round them, your window is opposite them, your carpet is below them. At this same moment, they are on many other screens, surrounded by different objects, different colors, different sounds. You are seeing them in the context of your own life. They are surrounded not by gilt frames, but by the familiarity of the room you are in and the people around you. Once, all these paintings belong to their own place. Some were altarpieces in churches. Originally, paintings were an integral part of the building for which they were designed. Sometimes, when you go into a Renaissance church or chapel, you have the feeling that the images on the wall are records of the building's interior life. Together, they make up the building's memory. So much are they part of the life and individuality of the building. Everything around the image is part of its meaning. Its uniqueness is part of the uniqueness of the single place where it is. Everything around it confirms and consolidates its meaning.
The extreme example is the icon. Worshippers converge upon it. Behind its image is God. Before it, believers close their eyes. They do not need to go on looking at it. They know that it marks the place of meaning. Now, it belongs to no place. And you can see such an icon in your home. The images come to you. You do not go to them. The days of pilgrimage are over. It is the image of the painting which travels now just as the image of me standing here in this studio travels to you and appears on your screen. The meaning of a painting no longer resides in its unique painted surface, which it is only possible to see in one place at one time. Its meaning, or a large part of it, has become transmittable. It comes to you, this meaning, like the news of an event. It has become information of a sort. The faces of paintings become messages, pieces of information to be used, even used to persuade us to help purchase more of the originals which these very reproductions have in many ways replaced. But, you may say, original paintings are still unique. They look different from how they look on the television screen or on postcards. Reproductions distort. Only a few Facsimiles don't. Take this original painting in the National Gallery. Only what you are seeing is still not the original. I'm in front of it. I can see it. This painting by Leonardo is unlike any other in the world. The National Gallery has the real one. It isn't a fake. It's authentic. If I go to the National Gallery and look at this painting, somehow I should be able to feel this authenticity. The Virgin of the Rocks by Leonardo da Vinci. It is beautiful for that alone. Nearly everything that we learn or read about art encourages an attitude, an expectation, rather like that. The National Gallery catalogue is for art experts. The entry on this painting is about 14 pages long, densely written. They are about who commissioned the painting, legal squabbles, who owned it, its likely date, the pedigree of its owners. Behind this information lie years of research. What for? To prove beyond any shadow of doubt that it is a genuine Leonardo. And to prove that an almost identical painting in the Louvre is in fact a replica. French art historians try to prove the opposite. For this drawing by Leonardo, the Americans wanted to pay two and a half million pounds. Now, it hangs in a room by itself, like a chapel, behind bulletproof perspex. The lights are kept low so as to prevent the drawing from fading. But why is it so important to preserve and display this drawing? It's acquired a kind of new impressiveness, but not because of what it shows, not because of the meaning of its image. It's become mysterious again because of its market value. And this market value depends upon it being genuine. And now it is here like a relic in a holy shrine. I don't want to suggest that there is nothing left to experience before original works of art, except a certain sense of awe because they have survived because they're genuine, because they're absurdly valuable. A lot more is possible. But only if art is stripped of the false mystery and the false religiosity which surrounds it. This religiosity, usually linked with cash value, but always invoked in the name of culture and civilization, is in fact a substitute for what paintings lost 
when the camera made them reproducible. The National Gallery sell more reproductions of this Leonardo cartoon than of any other picture. But what are the meanings these reproductions acquire in each home when they are hung or pinned to the wall? And how different are all these meanings from its original one, when Leonardo first worked on it to work out an idea for a painting? The camera, by making the work of art transmittable, has multiplied its possible meanings and destroyed its unique original meaning. Have works of art gained anything by this? They have lost and gained. Let me try to explain how. The most important thing about paintings themselves is that their images are silent, still. I can't demonstrate the stillness, for the lines on your screen are never still. And in a sense, the pages of a book are never still. But I can demonstrate the silence. Occasionally, this uninterrupted silence and the stillness of a painting can be very striking. The experience of this has almost nothing to do with what anybody teaches about art. It's as if the painting, absolutely still, soundless, becomes a corridor connecting the moment it represents with the moment at which you are looking at it. And something travels down that corridor at a speed greater than light, throwing into question our way of measuring time itself. Because paintings are silent and still, and because their meaning is no longer attached to them, but has become transmittable, paintings lend themselves to easy manipulation. They can be used to make arguments or points which may be different, very different, from their original meaning. And because paintings are essentially silent and still, the most obvious way of manipulating them is by using movement and sound. The camera moves in, to remove a detail of a painting from the whole. Its meaning changes. An allegorical figure becomes a pretty girl anywhere. From being part of a strange poetical world of metamorphosis, a dog can be turned into a pet, not unlike the dog of his master's voice. The meaning of a painting shown on film or television can be changed even more radically. This is a painting by Bruegel, or rather a reproduction of a painting by Bruegel, of the road to Calvary. If you look at the whole painting, Bruegel's intention is fairly clear. In the right foreground are Mary and John and the mourners of Christ. Christ carrying the cross is in the middle distance, carried forward by the crowd, which is making its way to the place of the crucifixes, far away on the right, where a circle of onlookers has already gathered. If you look at the whole picture, you see that it is about grief, about torture, and above all about the callousness, the eager inquisitiveness, the superstitious drive of the crowd. If it sets out to be a religious painting, it is an oddly secular one. But the difficulty is that on a screen, if you keep the whole painting in view, you don't see very much. You have been waiting impatiently for the camera to go in to examine details. Yet, as soon as this happens, the comprehensive effect of the painting can be changed. For example, it is possible to isolate and show the details in a way that makes the painting look like a fairly straightforward devotional picture. With a different camera movement again, it can be shown as an example of landscape painting. Or details can present it to you 
in terms of the history of costume or social customs. Most easily, it can be presented as a story. The two thieves being carted to the place of crucifixion, Christ carrying the cross. In a film sequence, the details have to be selected and rearranged into a narrative which depends on unfolding time. Yet, in the painting as a whole, all these elements are there simultaneously. In paintings, there is no unfolding time. As well as by the movements of the camera, paintings are modified and changed by the sounds you hear when looking at them. Here is a landscape, a cornfield with birds flying out of it. Look at it for a moment in silence. Now supposing I say whilst you look at it, this is the last picture Van Gogh painted before he killed himself. Words you notice consciously. Music is subtler. It can work almost without your noticing it. How often do you consciously notice the music played over paintings on television? Yet music and rhythm change the significance of a picture. Here's a painting by Caravaggio. Here are details of this painting cut to music from an Italian opera. No so cool now cut to a religious chorale. I've said that as soon as the meaning of a painting becomes transmittable, this meaning is liable to be manipulated and transformed. It's no longer a constant. It's changed by the camera which moves, by words put around it, by music played over it. Now lastly, paintings can be changed in another way. When paintings are reproduced, they become a form of information which is being continually transmitted, and so there they have to hold their own against all the other information which is jostling around them to appear on the same page or the same screen. The meaning of an image can be changed according to what you see beside it or what comes after it. Let's try a last experiment. We put the image of this well-known painting by Goya on your screen. You look at it in the context of what I'm saying, in the context of my image in relation to it. But supposing you had just turned onto this channel from one of the other two, then you might see something like this. Some years ago, up in the mountains that were white with snow, inside a cabin, McDougal, he was planning, there's gonna be a showdown with somebody he loves. And supposing now, you turn off from the R channel onto one of the others.
Each time, the impact of the Goya is modified. I've now emphasized the ways in which reproduction makes the meaning of works of art ambiguous. This is not as negative as it necessarily sounds, if we realize what is happening. What it means, in theory, is that reproduction of works of art can be used by anybody for their own purposes. Images can be used like words, we can talk with them. Reproduction should make it easier to connect our experience of art directly with other experiences. You can sometimes see how naturally this begins to happen when, for instance, children or adults pin up reproductions alongside snapshots or their own drawings or pages from magazines. There, everything belongs to the same visual language used for describing or recreating experience. What so often inhibits such a spontaneous process is the false mystification which surrounds art. For instance, the art book depends upon reproductions. Yet often, what the reproductions make accessible a text begins to make inaccessible. What might become part of our language is jealously guarded and kept within the narrow preserves of the art expert. These last two great paintings by Franz Hals portray the governors and the governesses of an almshouse for old paupers in the Dutch 17th century city of Harlem. Hals, an old man of over 80, was destitute. Most of his life he had been in debt. During the winter of 1664, the year he began painting these pictures, he obtained three loads of peat on public charity. Otherwise, he would have frozen to death. Here, he paints the official portraits of the administrators of such public charity. Reproductions in colour or in black and white, showing the whole or showing details, make these two paintings easily accessible. Yet this is how these images are introduced. Each woman stands out with equal clarity against the enormous dark surface, yet they are linked by a firm rhythmical arrangement and the subdued diagonal pattern formed by their heads and hands. Subtle modulations of the deep, glowing blacks contribute to the harmonious fusion of the whole and form an unforgettable contrast with the powerful whites and vivid flesh tones where the detached strokes reach a peak of breadth and strength. In the portrait of the men, House's old tendency of creating an impression of casual informality and the instantaneousness recurs. But the pictorial unity appears less successful than in earlier works. The intense light areas of the flesh tones, the great expanses of white linen and the daringly broad red touch on the knee of the man on the right tend to jump and are not fully integrated into a coherent design. That is a quotation from the most comprehensive book on Hals in English. It was published last year. It's as though the author wants to mask the images, as though he fears their directness and accessibility. As in so many other pictures by Hals, the penetrating characterizations almost seduce us into believing that we know the personality traits and even the habits of the men and women portrayed. And in the case of some critics, the seduction has been a total success. He speaks of seduction disparagingly. Yet what is this seduction? It's nothing less than the painting working on us. If the characterization is, as he says, penetrating, it penetrates to reveal something. It's as though he doesn't want us to make sense of it in our terms. And when he sums up, he resorts to meaningless generalizations. We attempt to control the powerful impact his paintings make upon us by considering the tradition in which he worked and the range of possibilities open to him. The effort only increases our admiration for House's unwavering commitment to his personal vision, which enriches our consciousness of our fellow men and heightens our awe for the ever-increasing power of the mighty impulses that enabled him to give us a close view 
of life's vital forces. This is mystification. Children, until they are educated out of it and are forced to accept the mystifications, look at images and interpret them very directly. They connect any image, whether from a comic or from the National Gallery, directly with their own experience. I showed a reproduction of the Caravaggio to a group of school children. I think it could have been they stole the food. One of them saying, I'm not going to eat it, it's stolen food. And then he's going, why not? Something um, like that. Yeah. You think he wants to get up? Yeah. He, he yeah. looks as if he's a bit Just about to cross the table. table. He looks all romantic and she wants to really go away and do something. I think that might be Jesus. <laughs> what makes you think it might be Jesus? Well, he's in the centre of the table and he looks like he might be a leader of some kind. He looks like a sheep to me. And, yeah. and they've got... They've got the um, food on the table there. Yeah, they haven't got bread or wine. Yes. What do the, what do the rest of you think about him saying that, that, that it might be Jesus? I don't think it's Jesus. He's got his own opinion. I don't think it's Jesus. Mm. Could be. Some of you think it's a man, and some of you think it's a woman. I think it's a woman. I think it's a woman. I think it's a woman. You can woman. Because she's got cards. Too fat to be a man. <laughs> it looks as though... They're all going to jump out and kiss her because she's just sitting there. <laughs> and he's got his arm out to cuddle her and he's jumping out and run around. I think it's a man. I think it's a woman. I think it's a woman. There's no bristles even. Yes, but he hasn't got any bristles. He got a moustache. Yes, but he hasn't got any bristles. Um, but all of the, all of, no, not quite all, but most of the boys thought that he was a man and most of the girls, you thought he, she, she was a woman. I'm not sure. What and you said she was, she was perhaps both. Because they were really looking, and really relating what they saw to their own experience. They recognised something that most adults wouldn't. Without knowing the artist's name, let alone anything about Caravaggio's life, or the fact that he was a homosexual, they immediately saw how sexually ambivalent the principal figure was. I can't pretend to the clairvoyance of children, but in the next three programmes, I'm going to try to relate the experience of art directly to other experiences and to use the means of reproduction as though they offered a language, as though pictures were like words rather than holy relics. How we see women, possessions, advertisements and their promises which surround us on every side. But remember that I am controlling and using for my own purposes the means of reproduction needed for these programs. The images may be like words, but there is no dialogue yet. You cannot reply to me. For that to become possible in the modern media of communication, access to television must be extended beyond its present narrow limits. Meanwhile, with this program, as with all programs, you receive images and meanings which are arranged. I hope you will consider what I arrange, but be skeptical of it. Men dream of women. Women dream of themselves being dreamt of. Men look at women. Women watch themselves being looked at. Women constantly meet glances which act like mirrors, reminding them of how they look or how they should look. Behind every glance is a judgment. Sometimes the glance they meet is their own, reflected back from a real mirror.
A woman is always accompanied, except when quite alone, and perhaps even then, by her own image of herself. While she is walking across a room, or weeping at the death of her father, she cannot avoid envisaging herself walking or weeping. From earliest childhood, she is taught and persuaded to survey herself continually. She has to survey everything she is and everything she does, because how she appears to others, and particularly how she appears to men, is of crucial importance for what is normally thought of as the success of her life. A woman in the culture of privileged Europeans is first and foremost a sight to be looked at. What kind of sight is revealed in the average European oil painting? There were portraits of women as there were portraits of men. But in one category of painting, women were the principal ever-recurring subject. That category was the nude. In the nudes of European painting, we can discover some of the criteria and conventions by which women were judged. We can see how women were seen. What then is a nude? In his book on the nude, Kenneth Clark says that being naked is simply being without clothes. The nude, according to him, is a form of art. I would put it differently. To be naked is to be oneself. To be nude is to be seen naked by others and yet not recognized for oneself. A nude has to be seen as an object in order to be a nude. In the European oil painting, nakedness is not taken for granted as in archaic art. Nakedness is a sight for those who are dressed. That is why Manet's painting, which really marks the end of the period I'm considering, is so profound a comment on all the works which preceded it. The story begins with the story of Adam and Eve as told in Genesis. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. And she gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And the Lord God called unto the man and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Unto the woman God said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Two things are striking about this story. They become aware of being naked because as a result of eating the apple, each sees the other differently. Nakedness is created in the mind of the beholder. The second striking fact is that the woman is blamed and is punished by being made subservient to the man. In relation to the woman, the man becomes the agent of God. In medieval art, the story is often illustrated scene following scene, as in a strip cartoon. During the Renaissance, the narrative sequence disappears and the single moment, which is nearly always depicted, is the moment of shame. The couple wear fig leaves or make a modest gesture with their hands. But now, their shame is not so much in relation to one another as to the spectator. It is the spectator's looking which shames them. Later, as painting became more secular, many other subjects offered the opportunity of painting nudes. But always in the European tradition, the nude implies an awareness of being seen by the spectator. They are not naked as they are. They are naked as you see them. Often, as with the favorite subject of Susanna and the Elders, this is the actual theme of the picture. We join the Elders to spy on her. She looks back at us, looking at her. Sometimes the woman, Susanna, looks at herself in a mirror, picturing to herself how men see her. 
she sees herself first and foremost as a sight, which means a sight for men. Thus, the mirror became a symbol of the vanity of women, yet the male hypocrisy in this is blatant. You paint a naked woman because you enjoy looking at her, you put a mirror in her hand, and you call the painting vanity, thus morally condemning the woman whose nakedness you have depicted for your own pleasure, and thus, incidentally, repeating the biblical example by blaming the woman. The judgment of Paris was another favourite mythological subject with the same inwritten idea of men looking at naked women and judging them. Paris awards the apple to the woman he finds most beautiful. Beauty in this context is bound to become competitive. The judgment of Paris is transformed into the beauty contest. Aesthetics, when applied to women, are not as disinterested as the word beauty might suggest. I don't want to deny the crucial part that seeing plays in sexuality, but there's a great difference between being seen as oneself naked or seeing another in that way and a body being put on display. To be naked is to be without disguise. To be on display is to have the surface of one's own skin, the hairs of one's own body, turned into a disguise, a disguise which cannot be discarded. Amongst the tens of thousands of European oil paintings of nudes, there are perhaps 20 or 30 exceptions, paintings in which the artist has seen the woman revealed as herself. This Rubens. This Rembrandt. This Georges de Latour. These paintings are as personal as love poems, and their character is quite distinctive. Most nudes in oil paintings have been lined up by their painters for the pleasure of the male spectator owner, who will assess and judge them as sights. Their nudity is another form of dress. They are condemned to never being naked. With their clothes off, they are as formal as with their clothes on. Those who are not judged beautiful are not beautiful. Those who are are given the prize. The prize is to be owned, that is to say, to be available. Charles II commissioned this secret painting from Lely. It's like hundreds of others. It might be Venus and Cupid. But in fact, it was a portrait of one of his mistresses, Nell Gwynne. It shows her passively looking at the spectator, staring at her naked. Her nakedness is not an expression of her own feelings. It is only a sign of her submission to his demand. The painting, when he shows it to others, demonstrates this submission. His guests envy him. By contrast, in another tradition, nakedness is a celebration of active sexual love as between two people, the woman as active as the man. The actions of each absorb the other. In oil painting, the second person or the second person who matters, is the stranger looking at the picture. Compare the expression of these two women. One the model for what is considered a masterpiece by Ang, and the other an ill-paid model for a photograph in a girly magazine. Or these two. Just the expression, the look. What do you see? It seems to me that in each pair the expression is remarkably similar and that it is an expression of responding with calculated charm to the man whom she knows is looking at her, although she doesn't know him. It is true that sometimes a painting includes a male lover, but the woman's attention is very rarely directed towards him. She looks away from him, or she looks out of the picture towards he who considers himself her true lover, the spectator owner. This painting was sent as a present from the Grand Duke of Florence to the King of France. The boy kneeling on the cushion and kissing the woman is Cupid. She is Venus. But the way her body is arranged has nothing to do with that kissing. Her body is arranged in the way it is to display it to the man looking at the picture. 
the picture is made to appeal to his sexuality. It has nothing to do with her sexuality. The convention of not painting the hair on a woman's body helps towards the same end. Hair is associated with sexual power, with passion. The woman's sexual passion needs to be minimized so that the spectator may feel that he has the monopoly of such passion. There were paintings which depicted male lovers. These did exist, but they were mostly private, semi-pornographic pictures. In most paintings which were painted to be seen rather than hidden, the only rival to the male spectator is a cupid. And how extraordinary it is that the pictorial symbol of passion was a small boy. For a similar reason, women in the European art of the oil painting are seldom shown dancing. They have to be shown languid, exhibiting a minimum of energy. They are there to feed an appetite, not to have any of their own. The appetite was theoretically gargantuan. The absurdity of this male flattery, although it was not seen as absurd then, reached its peak in the public academic art of the 19th century. Prime ministers discussed under paintings like this. When one of them felt he had been outwitted, he looked up for consolation. The nude in European oil painting is usually presented as an ideal subject. It is said to be an expression of the European humanist spirit. I don't want to reject entirely the truth of this, but I've tried to add to it, starting off from a different viewpoint. Dürer, who believed in the ideal nude, thought that this ideal could be constructed by taking the shoulders of one body, the hands of another, the breasts of another, and so on. Was this humanist idealism? Or was it the result of an indifference to who any one person really was? Do these paintings celebrate, as we're normally taught, the women within them, or the male voyeur? Is there sexuality within the frame or in front of it? I showed the programme, as you have seen it up till now, to five women. It began to seem absurd that the only images you were seeing were of women silent, mute. So I showed it to them and asked them to comment, to comment not so much on the programme but rather on the questions raised by it. Above all on the question of how men see women or have seen them in the past and how this influences the way women see themselves today. We have an image, of course we all have an image of ourselves and it's a visual image, uh, but I wonder how much this sort of classical European painting has shaped that image. In my own case, I find it quite impossible when I look at the paintings that you show in your film. I can't take them seriously. I cannot identify with them because they are so immensely exaggerated always. You know, they fasten on to some secondary sexual characteristic, you know, these enormous breasts and sort of great big bee sting bottoms, you know, and those huge <laughs> things like that. And they just aren't real. Whereas with photographs, um, you, you, can, you can feel that is potentially, that's possibly me, although no, it, it probably isn't. But these, these, nearly all the paintings you have shown, um, are what is called idealized. Um, and therefore, they are, to me, very unreal in connection with, with any deep down image that I might have of myself. And in connection with any deep down pleasure that I might have in mm. looking at another female body. They don't give me that kind of pleasure at all. I can admire them as painting, but they, are, they, they don't mean human beings to me. Um, the image that I compare myself with is the photograph, because it's with photographs that I've been encouraged to think of myself in this way. It is essentially advertising for me that's contributed to this. And consequently, I find it extremely interesting to go back and think of nudes in this way, because I've never done so. But having seen the film, I have no doubt that the same thing applies. And do you find the, the nudes in painting unreal in the same way? Yes. Well, you can't get any information from it, <laughs> can you? It's no guide towards the future. I mean, what How kind of information is lacking? Oh, well, activity, you know, dynamism, anything. <laughs> It is how someone sees you, and that's all. It's something laid upon you. I'm glad you showed the many picture, because I always find this 
extremely shocking, you know, because the men are dressed and, and the women are naked. And this seems to me sum up the whole situation. It's a humiliating position, and these women are aware of being humiliated. Um, and I think this is part of the whole scheme of things. I mean, as most people have had at some stage in their life, sort of nightmares about running through the streets with nothing on and everybody else is dressed. Uh, and this seems to me one element in the pictures. Um, a very interesting thing you said in the film was about um, how nudity was really a kind of disguise. It wasn't the real person themselves and free, but it was just another garment they were wearing, and worse than a garment in a sense, because it's something that you can't take off. This comes, I think, from nudity being combined with a pose. And that's inevitable if you're going to have a painting of a model. Um, in a way, I think that we're always dressing. We're always dressing up for a part, always uh, putting on a uniform of one kind or another. And I think women do this almost more than men. Men have only begun doing it fairly recently. Women are always dressing to show the kind of character that they want to, to represent, the mother, the working woman, the pretty young chick. Uh, and nudity is a uniform, in a way, for I'm ready now for sexual pleasure, you see. And so it doesn't, you, you, you, you, can't, com you can't identify being nude with being free. I've only just recently read that book, Histoire d'eau, um, which describes um, the way in which a woman is reduced for the sexual pleasure of the man she's in love with to a complete object. And what struck me in all that book as the most impressive image was the fact that she was told that she was never to touch her own breasts, to entirely close her mouth, or to close or to put her legs together. And so the whole point about her stance all the time was that she was available. And this, the sense of being available, the sense of waiting for other people, is the very antithesis of action. And it, you know, uh, just like the whole the, the Brook Street Bureau advertisement, Tony hasn't rung, for, you know, he's three minutes late in ringing. And you feel this whole situation, you know, the number of women you talk to who say, mm -hmm. I stay in so many nights a week waiting for somebody to ring. You know, mm -hmm. That the, the concept of availability implies passivity, because if you're simply waiting for somebody else to act, then you can't act yourself. Yes, it's, it's like um, you will awake when a man taps you, you know, when a man kisses you, you will arise and get off your bed. But um, really it's an excuse to get yourself going. I think women are too shy. Yeah. They're, they're waiting too long. <laughs> yes, yes. Could I say something there about narcissism? I think that both men and women are narcissistic, but in different senses. And I think that one, in, sometimes I, I have the impression that men and women are tremendously narcissistic and cut off from each other by their images of themselves, but that whereas a woman's image of herself is derived directly from other people, the mirror you're talking about, um, a man's image of himself is derived from the world. That is, it's the world that gives him back his image because he acts in it. and. You know, women are drawn to him as a source, uh, as a centre of activity and as a, a source of worth. I mean, since he is in the world, the fact that he values her is important. Um, and so because they're sort of centres of narcissism are different um, and the woman's is essentially only related to the other person, she's in a much more passive position than he is in relation to it. Yes. Do you see, do you see narcissism as essentially a, a, a, a negative or positive phenomenon? Well, I think that's very difficult to answer, but in the sense that it is related to identity, um, it's a positive phenomenon. And it seems to me that what women envy in men a lot of the time is that they have a sense of their own identity, that there is something in them which is important to them, other than simply what other people think of them. And I think that that thing is the product of their interaction with the world, that is, other things and other people. And it's sort of, it's almost as if through this interaction they actually build up a store of worth, a sense of themselves, um, which, it, which is a constant, I mean, it can't be lost. But that because the woman doesn't go out and act, she doesn't create the store, 
she waits only for the present interaction with a man. Mm -hmm. that, and that can go, that can just end at any moment. Um, there's something here that really I'd like to twist around a little bit, because narcissism is a very sort of pronounced way of stating a relationship to the world, whether it's a man or a woman, isn't it? But um, this other question, which is contained within it, but doesn't go as far as it as an idea, is this sort of self-delight of a person, whether it's a man or a woman, in life, in what they're doing, in their relationships with men or women. Uh, and it's a thing that matters tremendously. And it's not only a kind of inner thing by which you live, but it's a very outer thing by which you gain relationships with your own context in the world that you can't gain any other way. That it's when you have somehow been made so unconscious of yourself that you easily, naturally, sort of compulsively go out to whatever is going on around you. Now, when you're a child, that tends more than with people to be other things, doesn't it? Mountains, streams, wherever you go. Um, uh, and then only gradually, as you go on, you make this kind of absolutely necessary contact with people. But I do think that the sort of essence of self-delight as a kind of possible thing in the modern world and something that fewer women have than men and want. Günü ve gündemi yeni bakışla yakalayın. Her gün uyandığınızda güne adanın tarafsız gazetesi yeni bakışla başlamanın ayrıcalığını yaşayın. Tek ses değil, çok sesliliği sayfalarına taşıyan yeni bakış tam 48 sayfa. Tarafsız, bağımsız, bağlantısız habercilik yeni bakışta. Ülkenin özgür ve doğru haberciliği için durmadan çalışan yeni bakış sadece kulislerin değil... Adanın her köşesinin nabzını tutmaya devam ediyor. Halkla beraber Halk İşin Gazete. Yeni Bakış. Adanın Tarafsız Gazetesi. Yeni Bakış Web TV, yeni neslin televizyon anlayışıyla web formatında yayınlarını sizlerle buluşturuyor. Zengin kadrosu ve tarafsız habercilik anlayışıyla haberden sanata, çevreden yaşama kadar toplumun nabzını tutan Yeni Bakış Web TV sizin sesiniz olmaya devam ediyor. Arkadaşlar merhaba. Şimdi size birkaç soru soracağım. Hiçbirinizin bu sorulardan haberi yok. Verdiğiniz cevaplar sonucunda size bir video izleyeceğim. Ve videoyu izledikten sonra düşüncelerinizi alacağım. Hazırsanız başlayalım. Hazırım. Hazırım. Hazırım. Başlayabiliriz. Başlayalım. Adın ne? Taylan. Mutlu. Kahvaltı öğle yemeği ya da akşam yemeği yedin mi? Evet yedim. Ne yedin? 
Tavuk, yoğurt, patates, domates, salata. Akşam ne yemeği düşünüyorsun? Çiğ köfte. Akşam kuru fasulye pilav yemeği düşünüyorum. Günde kaç öğün yemek yiyorsun Yunus? Üç, bazen dördü de bulabiliyor. İki ya da üç. Kaç saattir yemek yemiyorsun yani en son ne zaman yemek yedin? Dört saat. En son sanırım bir saat, bir buçuk saat önce yedim. Peki en çok sevdiğin yemek hangisi? Şu an en çok istediğim künefe. Mantı. 